everybody. Welcome to today's uh, Facebook Live. And we're going to be talking um, about pornography, disclosure specifically, and, and just a little bit about pornography and eroticism. And um, I will tell you uh, right away that I, I talk about this topic with some trepidation. <laughs> because uh, even when I think about how to respond to some of these questions, I have about uh, five or six different meaning frames that I think are a part of these challenging issues. And I feel like when I start to sort of think about one of them or talk about one of them, all the others sort of unexplored or un... Um, challenge then can make it sound like I'm saying something I'm not saying. So it's a little bit tricky, but there's so much need for it that I feel like I've got to at least try to talk a little bit about this with you. I'm, as some of you may know, um, I am developing a men's sexuality course. We'll be doing it in the fall. It will be only about 30 men that will be invited to do it. And they will be people who have already taken um, either the relationship course or the enhancing sexual intimacy course. Uh, but if you know you're interested in doing the men's course, um, make sure you um, get on our email list because it will only go out to people who are on the email list. Um, and then we'll be doing it again to a much larger group in the winter. Um, but I'll be talking a lot more about pornography there and eroticism and the issues of deception and dishonesty and ownership of sexuality and all that that, that play into these questions. And so I'll be able to be much more thorough there and um, do a little better job than I'm going to probably be able to do today in, in helping you think through some of these things. But I'm hoping I can at least give you some questions to think about or some ways to think about how you each think about the issue of pornography and um, if there might be some new ways to start thinking about it or exploring it um, as a couple to how to say it, like release some of the toxicity of it or to be able to move forward in a little different way. One of the things I just want to remind everybody of is just be aware that when you post things, your name is attached to it. So just make sure you're not talking about your spouse or saying something that you can't be comfortable having on there later as the group um, members may watch it. And also because we tend to post some of this after six months um, on our YouTube channel. So so just be thoughtful about that. Um, one of the things I might do is, I'm sort of gonna be reading, I'll be reading a couple of questions that came in and um, I will be um, asking some questions of the questioner who's not on the call, right? Or, well, I don't know if they are, but because they're anonymous questions. Um, but what I might ask you to do if you're listening is to give some responses. Like, what do you think is a common fear or anxiety? And we will know that they're not necessarily your fears or anxieties or not related to your life necessarily, but it will allow me to kind of think through some of the different meanings that people are carrying um, that. Okay, so let me just read a couple of the questions and I'll start with one and a lot of it's going to be helping you think about the meanings that are in the questions themselves. This person says, I recently discovered that my husband has had a porn habit for at least 15 years. We are currently working on finding a therapist to find the root of this habit, but I'm not sure what is wise in the meantime. I feel like he has been abstaining from porn since I found out. I don't want to be sexual with him right now, and I don't feel like I'm in a place to do that right now. And I... Um, and I don't want to create duty sex. He told me the other day that he would need a release soon. The way he told me, I feel like he was asking how he could do this in a way that was acceptable. My problem is, I don't know. I feel like I shouldn't do it, but if I let him take care of it, then he is just going back to porn. Okay, so I think this question captures a lot of the pieces that are, are sort of in collision or being challenged when uh, someone, and especially the spouse, is confronting that, that their husband, in this case, has been looking at porn. Um, so one of the, I think there's about four, maybe there's more issues kind of operating in this question. 
So one issue, of course, that is often an issue for people is just the issue of deception. There's been prevaricating about who one is in the marriage. And often we're comfortable with holding information about who we are from our spouse, but we don't want them to withhold information about who they are from us. Okay, and that is because we don't want to feel like our choices are being taken from us. We don't want to feel like we're being deceived into a kind of loyalty or trust that isn't based in something real. And so, so there's two pieces. One is just the fact that somebody's been keeping information from you that they know would be relevant. That's why they haven't told it to you, right? It's one thing to just forget to mention something, but you're not trying to withhold information. It's another thing to actively keep your spouse from having the information about you. And then there's the issue of what does it say about you that this is in fact a reality? You know, for many of the women that I work with who have had a basic, you know, their husbands have often been invested in the idea that they're the strong ones, they're the spiritual leaders, um, sometimes even the idea they came from a more solid family than the wife did. And so there's a lot of investment in this picture for both people, for the husband and the wife. And then when it actually comes out, and oftentimes these kind of hero role husbands that are kind of taking on all kinds of things are much more likely to have a kind of covert and more hidden um, sex uh, life or reality around their sexuality. But it can be really disorganizing and disorienting for someone when they realize that you're not Mr. Righteousness and Mr., you know, a strong straightforward guy you in fact have more secrets than you let on and so that can be very disorganizing too especially when someone has related to their spouse to their husband as a kind of protector as a kind of security and they've really been very um, invested in that idea and, and often both have been very invested in the idea so it's very disorganizing for both of those reasons. Um, so I think a really important question for any couple to confront in that is just a starting point is why has there been deception, right? Why is there an absence of transparency? Because, you know, what does it say about the marriage? What does it say about the partner? Uh, what does it say about each of your ideas about sex? Right. How has this marriage been organized that the prevarication, that the deception made sense? And this isn't to be damning of the couple, but more to understand how have we operated that this is how we've handled the reality of sexuality between us or who we each are sexually or what we actually think and feel around this topic. Um, has the husband been hiding it because he feels that the wife really can't handle it? You know, she freaks out anytime there's any uh, acknowledgement that he wants something or is interested in something that's outside of her comfort zone. Is it that he wants to keep alive the idea that he's the strong, good one and this challenges that picture and so he likes hiding it? Is he doing things that are... Um, you know, he, he ha sometimes I see where men in marriages where they have kind of an over-functioning, under-functioning dynamic. The over-functioning husband, and I don't mean that as a compliment, meaning that they're, they're kind of the one that takes on lots of responsibilities. They feel enough resentment about that at the same time that they are the ones participating in it, that it's what they use to justify their own latitude. Just They just say, oh, well, I, she can't handle things. She's very fragile. So they have a way of justifying their, the, the latitude or the entitlement that they give to themselves, but then they basically take what gives them comfort or reinforces them, but they're not really relating to their spouse as an equal or as a partner, as a person who deserves to know. And so the exposure of that can be very distressing. All right. And, and both that, hey, you would keep information from me, that you're condescending to me. You've been telling, that this happened in many cases where they're telling the bishop, the bishop says, don't tell your wife, we'll collude in the idea that she can't handle it, but you can repent with me. And so there's this whole kind of protectionism of the wife 
where she feels really, really distressed and upset by the way that she's kept out of that, the respect of, of basically knowing who her husband is and what's going on and being able to make decisions for herself. Now, sometimes wives participate in their disrespect, um, even unwittingly. That is to say, they've been sort of socialized into a kind of dependency, a kind of blindness, uh, kind of wanting their husband to not share too much of who he is sexually, to not, um, to kind of, they want the fantasy that he's the strong one. And so they may be upset that their spouse doesn't treat them like an equal partner, but they're also not not operating and, and relating to the marriage from a position of equality either. And again, I'm not saying these with harsh judgment. I'm saying it that when we are in development, as we all are, we tend to gravitate to the meanings that we are comfortable enough in. And often in marriage, we find meanings that then link into each other and reinforce our weaknesses. And so oftentimes these crises, as painful as they are, give you a chance to actually uh, expose what's operating between you. They expose the marriage where it is. Um, they expose, you know, at least the partner. Um, uh, uh, and a lot of times, one thing I'll say is that when pornography, it is such a hot topic. I mean, it's to say it's high, high reactivity culturally that it makes it harder for us to understand it because we're in so much reaction right up front. And this is true for anybody in the, that wants to live a meaningful and deliberate life. The more reactive we are, even to our own thoughts and feelings and so on, if we're rushing, say, let's say we're an anxious person and we immediately rush into a, a kind of avoidance strategy when we're anxious, go into distractions, step away from what we need to do, start watching, you know, YouTube or something like that. The more reactive we are, the less able we are to actually take a look at what's happening and what's the meaning of it and who am I in this and is this what I want and who is the other person. And so my encouragement is for us to try hard to be less reactive and to dare to walk towards it enough to understand. One of my challenges in answering these things is there's there's so many different meanings that couples are negotiating in which porn may be involved, you know, and so it isn't ever just one meaning. So understanding what the meaning is in your couple, in your relationship is really important. Um, let me just see, what, is it potentially possible or advisable, wise for the wife in this scenario to have sexual intimacy be aspirational, even though she isn't necessarily feeling it rather than have it be something she can only do as the capstone result of her feeling safe and loved if and when they eventually get there. Uh, yes, I mean, th there, there's so many pieces of that, it's a little bit hard to answer it, but yes. Uh, but this idea that I need to feel perfectly safe and loved before I dare to be my own agent, to be my own chooser, to decide how I'm gonna relate to my sexuality and to you, is a problematic meaning that we're very accustomed to. And it's part of this question, which is your job, and especially women have been taught to think this with men, is that your job is to make me feel safe and loved. That's a lot of the reason why the deception's happening. It's because you're supposed to be the strong one who makes me feel good about myself, makes me feel desirable, makes me feel sufficient, wakes up my, opens me up sexually and so on. And it's kind of giving away as women, too much of our power and our strength, we're too seduced by the idea that we are vulnerable to another person's limitations. And I'm trying to think if I can say that a little differently. Um, meaning, if we really, as women, think of ourselves as agents, as strong individuals, we can make choices and then make decisions if we think something is not in line with what we want doesn't uh, is undermining us in some way we're much more robust and resilient than sometimes we uh, the way that we talk about ourselves relative to men and so I think sometimes people will use the idea that I'm not gonna have sex until I feel perfectly safe with you as a way to never have to have sex again or to take any risks because the onus is entirely on the spouse and that's the wrong model for intimacy because it's a dependency model 
On the other hand, I would never encourage someone to have trust with someone that they think is fundamentally untrustworthy or that they think is a bad idea to open themselves up to, uh, which is different than a flawed person that you uh, want to be sexual with and that you trust yourself enough, this is really what it is, to make good decisions based on what you map and understand about who your spouse is. Um, I'm gonna see if I'm gonna take very many of these because I will never get to the other one. How common do you think it is for Mormon women or even women in general to marry a man for whom they have never felt any sexual desire? Uh, I don't know really statistically how common it is, but I don't think it's uncommon. Uh, at least within the clients that I've worked with, a lot of times people, women will have felt, felt a lot of sexual desire towards kind of like the stereotypical bad boys. And then they married the Peter Priesthood because it felt safer or because they felt like this is somebody that I can pull off not really being sexual with or people because we are so afraid of sexuality and this isn't just an LDS thing this exists in the larger culture too but we're afraid that sexuality is corrosive that it's that it will undermine family life and so a lot of people want to uh, kind of put a boundary between sexuality and their marriage and so this is not about just hijacking someone else's life. It's kind of a collusion in a low, low risk, low exposure marriage. And a lot of times the men who marry into that, and I'll be careful, I don't mean to say it's like their fault too, but sometimes on some level, they, all, they have their own ambivalence. They may resent that their wife doesn't desire them, but they also have their own ambivalence about how sexual uh, they are, how comfortable they are with sexuality. I'll talk a lot about this in the men's course because even if you're the higher desire man, you, my experience is men have just as much uncertainty about exposure and investment and sort of being able to kind of stand on their own feet around who they are as women do. Uh, it's just that they resent that they can't get the validation sexually from their lower desire spouse. And I know I'm speaking stereotypically right now around higher desire men. Um, Okay, this person says, I think maybe he was worried about telling me because I have a strong moral sense of right and wrong and he was afraid that I would judge him. Yes, I mean, for sure, for sure. That that's, you know, people are afraid of that even if somebody doesn't have a strong moral sense that if you aren't in integrity in your choices, it's very hard to kind of go and bring it to someone else knowing that they may well have their judgment about it. And so it's really easy to be dishonest, this is our favorite way as human beings, is dishonesty is a way if we try to give ourselves a loophole or a pass to not deal with our own contradictions within ourselves. So a lot of times we get more focused on other people's reactions as a way of actually paradoxically carving out a space for us to be in contradiction within ourselves. So, so you know, in the next question, the woman is similarly trying to be very calm and non-reactive because she wants her husband to come forward and tell her things. But, which I think, you know, I think that's smart. You don't want to be like freaking out and making it very difficult to get information that would be valuable to you as a person and in the couple. But sometimes we're trying to be in control as a way of having control imagining that the issue of our reactivity is the primary issue when it could, it could be a part of it but it also often is about how much integrity does this person really want to push themselves to live within how much are they taking themselves on around who they are and and how they're in relationship to their eroticism and their sexuality um because if you're really in integrity in your own position this is not so much about getting your spouse to be okay with you and your choices. It's it's more about living honestly and out of contradiction within yourself and in your marriage. Th then, you know, if I have time, I make it to a third question that came in where a spouse, uh, he came forward about his pornography use. His wife was very upset at first, then things really got a lot better, and then she went back into a lot of anger about it. And um, he's saying, you know, is there a way forward? What's the max? What's the most likely way for her to uh, be able to make room for 
the reality of me and my sexuality? And I think the answer to that is uh, simple but not easy, which is more integrity within your position. That you really can be at peace with your position in the context of your marriage because if you really are at peace, you don't have to lie about it. You don't have to coddle her. You don't have to coddle your position. You can own your position. And then you're a force to be reckoned with. Now, she, in this case, she may still want to push you on that because she wants the control of having the marriage go her way or having um, feeling a sense of control over you. That's what we do when we're weak. We don't control ourselves. We try to control our spouse. So the way out is not trying to get your wife to be okay with you, is to for you to be honestly in integrity with yourself, honestly solid in your own position. That's the most helpful thing because then you're owning a position, you don't have to lie about it, you don't have to pretend, you don't have to get, and then she is in a position to deal with who she's gonna be in the face of that strength, okay? That, the strength of an honest position. Okay, um, I talk about this a lot in the relationship course and the sexuality course, which is this integrity of self is a really big deal and it's much easier to fight with our spouse or be upset that they don't see things the way we want them to see it rather than dealing with who we are. And this is very much alive in the issue of pornography because pornography is a validation issue, first and foremost. I mean, if, if I were to say there's something that it kind of captures on both sides is the issue of validation because a lot of times people are looking at porn as a way to kind of uh, get away from the invalidation and the exposure and the anxiety that they feel in an intimate relationship. Either they feel rejected there, they don't feel sexually self-confident, they, uh, maybe they have a, a spouse that really likes sex and wants sex, but they feel inadequate in some way or they don't really want to love through their sexuality because it's too, um, they don't want to deal with it at that level. And so porn can be a way to kind of get easy, uh, have sexual pleasure without having to confront invalidation. And so um, so I think that that's often why people will go to it. Or people will go to a lots of distractions when they're confronting challenging things in their lives and in their relationships. and. It can be food and it can be video games and it can be pornography and it can be a lot of ways that we try to kind of soothe our anxieties, but often at the expense of being really able to address the anxiety and then some, then often creating more anxiety in our, our attempts to cope with the initial ex experience of it. So then, then the issues of validation, just going back to that point, um, and I may have to come back and answer some of your questions after the live. I may write some things in the comments. But um, uh, but also validation is very much at, at stake here. When a spouse comes and says, I've been looking at porn, very often the feeling is, wait a minute, what does that say about me? I mean, what does it say about you? But what does it say about me and about us? And is this some kind of a statement about my adequacy? And sometimes that can be just like, can be a spouse who's enjoyed sex and has been very, you know, very much liked to be sexual, and it can still feel like a challenge to her sense of sufficiency. Other times it's a spouse who hasn't liked sex, who hasn't really wanted to have or develop or known how to develop a strong sexual relationship. And so it feels even like more, even more of a challenge because there's some sense of culpability within her. Um, okay, let me just see what this person says. So if porn is a form of validation, does that mean the other spouse is somewhat responsible for the use their partner has? No. Does, well, well I, that's a little too simple maybe. Does this trump the it is a choice mindset or is this a two people issue? Well, that's that's exactly going to this point here like sometimes you know I've worked with couples where she likes sex and and is often wanting him to come to bed and he in one case that comes to mind he preferred porn he preferred the solitude of it he preferred the control within it he often had resentment towards her I mean whether or not it was justified is maybe another question but he would kind of 
feel gratified in a way by not giving her what she wanted and finding ways to be sexual on his own. I think there was a, some pleasure in that withholding from her in the case in my head. Um, so, but if you, you know, on the other hand, if you're in a marriage and you have, you know, run the marriage from, um, from the bottom in a way, like I'm not going to deal with my sexuality. I don't want to, I think sex is disgusting. Your sexuality is disgusting. I'm saying it in a kind of an extreme way, but if you're like not really wanting to deal with the sexual aspect of marriage, well, I wouldn't say that you're culpable because everybody always gets to make choices, but you are, may well be a part of the context of your spouse's choices. So, um, so I think you have to be careful about the issue of responsibility. You're, you're never responsible, say your spouse cheats on you. You are not ever responsible for that choice in the sense that only they can make the choice. But you, sorry, but you may be responsible for the context in which an affair made sense. You may have part of the responsibility, I'm trying to say. So, and so you wanna deal with what you are responsible for and nothing more and nothing less. But um, those conversations can get tricky because oftentimes people want to make the other person <laughs> responsible for their choices uh, rather than getting wise about what, what was the co-construction, how did we participate. Um, this person says, I feel like it's my fault. Um, he said he started watching it because we would fight so much when we first got married and he would just turn to porn and it would be easier. Yeah. Mm. But that is, okay, so let me, I'll tease that one out for you a little bit. I mean, on the one hand, um, yeah, that, that probably in the face of the conflict, maybe there was some disillusionment for him around what marriage, what he thought it was going to be. Mm, I mean, it, it could be that the fighting was very healthy, actually, okay? But it could be that he didn't like it or that it was distressing for him or made him feel impotent or unable to create a good marriage, right? So the fact that he goes and copes by looking at porn is its own issue, meaning it's worth him thinking about and looking at. And is that an effective way to cope? I mean, the, 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 the research on porn and its impact on marriage would suggest no, that is not a good way to handle it. Um, there's, there's, I'll talk about this more in the men's course, but there's a lot of issues, and I talk about this in the Enhancing Sexual Intimacy course as well, but, you know, there's a lot about understanding eroticism, okay, and porn is one version of eroticism, and, and we have a lot of anxiety about eroticism just in general, and that's a piece that needs to be kind of teased out in this whole conversation that we may not get to today, but, but going... Um, and dealing with your anxiety, your frustration. A lot of times what people do is that they, they will go to something like porn or seeking the validation of another person in part as an expression of their hostility in the merit towards their spouse, that they can't get from their spouse the validation they want, the feelings of approval or acknowledgement that they imagined they were going to get in marriage and they handle it in their resentment by kind of turning away from the marriage in some form or another. And, you know, even if porn ceased to exist, that's still a problematic pivot because, I mean, it's a very human one, but it's a problematic one because unless the pivot away is helping you get more able to deal with the partnership, the partnership, fi finding an outside source, whether that's calling your mother or going and eating or looking at porn or any of the myriad ways that we can often get out of the intensity of a duality, meaning the ways that we're getting pressured by a relationship and split and get some comfort, it actually stabilizes the um, fracture because we're managing the stress of that fracture in some other way. So it's not a, a very, um, it's not a good pivot. Um, and, and then it can have its own impact because of the guilt or the discomfort or what you are, you know, how your sexuality may be evolving within that vacuum of experience and impact. Just so you know, my, my, it seems like it keeps telling me that I'm 
I'm sort of glitching. I don't know if I am or not, but okay. Um, yeah, and, and so to that person's question, you, you know, it's probably worth, was I, um, I don't know if, is everybody okay? Like they can hear me all right? Let me just scroll up. Okay, let me know if you're having a hard time hearing me. Uh, but you know, you were, okay, good, excellent. All right, I won't pay attention to it. So if you know that you are being super hostile in the beginning of the marriage, if you know you were um, doing things that were irresponsible, I, it, it still doesn't mean you're responsible for your spouse's choice because they could have handled it by coming to you and saying, look, you're being really cruel in these conversations and they're making me want to go away from you and I, I want a marriage with you, but you've, you, you, you've got to handle your anger in a more constructive way. You know, so he could have done that, okay? But, but it still might mean that you do want to take some responsibility for um, how you participated in at least the marital problem if you did. But that's different than saying I'm responsible for the way you handled it. Okay, um, someone just said no sound now. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna assume I'm okay. So let me just see some of the other ideas here. Um, so I think another idea that's in this question is the idea that you can't, uh, you, that you can't touch your own genitals. And so it's the spouse's job, okay? That's a very common idea that um, that in the church, I think we've really kind of talked about sexuality this way, is that sexual feelings must always be expressed in a mutually reinforcing way or else they're not righteous or they're dangerous, right? And so that's this idea like the husband saying, you know, you know, I know I've been looking at porn and I know you don't wanna have sex with me, all of that I get, but, um, basically that he would need a release soon and he's trying to say like like you're the only legitimate way is what i take from that qu the question and she's saying wait now what because if i'm the only legitimate way to do this um and i don't want to touch your genitals <laughs> uh and i don't want to be close to you because i have some feelings about how you've been handling your sexuality what now because if i don't i'm in a catch-22 is what she's saying and so, so um, I think that if this is just something that I'm just gonna kind of throw out as a, something to think about. <clears throat> Again, I talk about this in the Enhancing Sexual Intimacy course and the Art of Desire course, but that's, I don't think that's a helpful way for us to think about our sexuality, is that it belongs to our spouse or that uh, we can't have an orgasm unless they're giving us one. I think a better way to think about it, because, because even if you have a spouse that's always interested, okay, that's, it's still a meaning frame that undermines the question of intimacy because then it's more about mutual ownership and um, trying to control the other person to make sure their sexuality reinforces you. Okay, and that's a tempting idea. Like who doesn't want the idea that their spouse's sexuality will always revolve around them? I mean, I like that idea. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, but so, so it's a, t of course our narcissism and our insecurity, we, we want that, we like that idea. So it's easy to kind of codify that kind of idea, but it actually interferes with intimate sex because in intimate sex, it's the idea that I am a person on my own I'm a sexual being, I have my own thoughts and feelings and choices, and I choose to invest in you. I choose to share my sexuality with you. But not because I have to, because I, if I don't, I'm a terrible person because it, my genitals belong to you because we got married in the temple. Those are about ownership and control. And then it can't be about choosing. And so if you say like, like my sexuality was a, um, Yes, reclaim your genitals. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. So, um, should have t-shirts like that. So, um, but um, yeah. So, it, if it's about intimacy, then it's saying, look, I, I, um, th my sexuality is a gift um, to me, and I am a whole self, and I 
choose you. I want to share myself with you. I want to love and be loved through my sexuality. I want to desire and be desired. That's an act of a chooser, of an agent. So to this woman's question, I would say, you know, that's really on your husband. And, and that may give you a sense of insecurity because you may want the control of being the one who brings him to orgasm, okay? Even though you don't want to have to be there for it. And so, uh, you know, the, the only way out of that is in a sense to give your husband the responsibility for how he is relating to his sexuality. That that is ultimately, if you're ever gonna be safe in this marriage or feel safe is what I mean, is that you have to let him make those choices and you then um, decide if he's choosing in a way that you are comfortable with, that you want to be a part of, right? Um, and so <clears throat> the issue is whether or not he's gonna handle his sexuality with higher integrity or not. And how he does that is gonna be about how honest he is, honest with himself, and whether or not what he's doing is manipulative or undermines you um, or himself, okay? So I would suggest giving him that responsibility rather than you trying to control it because, you know, it comes up in the second question where she wants to be nice enough to kind of know what's going on. It's an effort to get control over the other person. And, and believe me, that it's tempting. I understand the wish we have you know, we want to give our children their agency as long as they use it in the right way, okay? Or we don't want to hijack our spouse's life as long as it reinforces us at all times. So it's easy, um, it's a tempting idea, but the only way you really are happy in marriage and really feel a sense of freedom in marriage is when you know that both people are choosing to be there and choosing to be there in an honest way way that they want the intimacy or they they tolerate the intimacy of really being knowable okay uh, and if if you want to be knowable you stop lying and you stop pretending and you take deeper responsibility for you who you are uh, and that's not the same thing as whether or not you touch your genitals okay that it's being honest and responsible and knowable okay um, uh, just another couple questions I wrote down here just to think about with this first question is what is the meaning of the porn and masturbation? What is my husband doing? And why is he doing it? How often? And why that often? Okay, so that is to say like it's not about tr tr trying to give him the, you know, what do you call that? The fifth degree? How, I can't remember what that, <laughs> that expression is. It's not because you're trying to, you know, prosecute. You're trying to um, understand and the temptation is to control the temptation is to punish a lot of people don't want to have sex because they want to punish and that's their primary goal not control themselves so much as control their spouse if you don't want to have sex as a way of controlling you that makes good sense to me if you're doing it because you want to have control over your spouse you're setting up the same trap this is about each he's lying to you to try and control you you are withholding sex to try and control him and you get caught in a, you create a knot that is very hard to undo because it's the, the control is in the other person, not in you. The locus of control is in the other person. So, um, but if you're trying to understand it, that, then you can at least understand who is this person I'm married to? What informs his choices? Uh, what is the, uh, so yeah, so the, this question of who are you and what are you about? And can I better understand? Like, well, you say you were so angry or that we fought a lot and then you went to porn. Can you help me understand that link? You know, what's the link between our fights and your porn use? And I want to know and I don't want to know, but I'm going to pull the part of me that wants to know. How do you make sense of that? Because it can be scary to know because it might reveal something about you that you don't want to see. It might reveal something about your spouse that you don't want to see, but starting to really understand it. And um, yeah, this can be hard around emotionally charged things. I'm a listener by profession, right? And my you know, adolescent son was saying to me a while ago, I just feel like you're not good at listening to me. And I'm like, oh gosh, okay. He might be right because 
a lot of things he was trying to figure out, I, I thought he's not doing it in the right way. So no, well, don't think about it that way. Think about it this way. You should just think of it this way. Like, this is the right answer, I promise you. People pay me a lot for this. Just give <laughs> And I didn't want to listen. I wanted control. Okay. So he's absolutely right in the feedback to me because it's much harder to just sit back and understand and recognize this isn't in my control. This is in my spouse's control or my son's control or whoever it is. And... I've got to settle myself down about that, even though it may impact me or you know cause feelings in me. Uh, but the way to love is to settle down enough to know uh, who we are uh, in relationship with. And that not only helps them, but it helps us to get clear about what we're responsible for and what we're not. So let me just quickly go over the other question and just see if there's other things I wanna sort of point out in there. This person writes, it's a similar kind of question. I discovered my husband's porn use four months ago. Apparently it's been an issue off and on before we got married, since before we got married, um, more than a decade ago. We talked extensively about it and although it was extremely painful, I was very careful to handle it calmly. The dishonesty is the most painful piece and I want him to feel comfortable coming to me in the future about anything. Right. And again, as I talked about, this is often about wanting control or wanting the information. And so being calm is a way to get it. And, and there's nothing wrong with saying I need to be calm enough to know what's happening here. Um, but you, you just want to keep track of the idea that you're going to control this because that's fundamentally not true. That's the hard thing about marriage is we only get to control ourselves. Many of us try to control our spouse. Uh, in many ways, either from covert versions of it or overt versions of it. But um, that's always a function of our immaturity and not wanting to face the real challenge of controlling who we are in the dynamic of marriage. Um, she goes on to say, I even opened up to viewing it together. Although he said he felt badly that it hurt me, he doesn't see it as a big problem. It never interfered with our active sex life. Okay, so let me just finish the question and I'll come back to some of my comments. He still views it frequently alone. The only difference is he isn't deleting his browser history since I told him I didn't want him hiding these things from me. I've done a lot of work to help him feel comfortable coming to me, but I'm still struggling so much with him viewing alone so often. It's almost daily lately. This feels like such a strange place to be in trying to help him open up, but at the same time being in so much emotional turmoil over it. I plan to have another big conversation about my hope for him to stop viewing alone after I've had a little more time to work through this. I have no one to talk to about this and I don't think it's helpful to keep rehashing it with him every time I've had a hard day. Some days my thoughts get the best of me and I feel crazy. How do I navigate through this? It seems most people either shame the porn user or are completely okay with porn use I'm in the middle somewhere. Please tell me it gets easier. Yeah, this idea of being in the middle and you're trying to figure out what that really means for you and, and how you kind of navigate it. And what I would suggest just straight up is, is in some ways getting a hold of your own thoughts and feelings because they are trying to tell you something about what, you're, uh, what the meaning is you're trying to tease apart and or what the meanings are that are operating within you that are driving you crazy. And so getting a better sense of what am I having trouble with? And what is my, um, why am I in reaction? And again, I'm not saying this to pathologize it. I'm saying it to get you to like really think about what's the meaning that I'm having a hard time with. Um, and um, how does it square with his view? What, what is my thought about his view? So uh, let me just go back to some of this. Um, let me go back. To, so she says, although he said he felt badly that it hurt me, he doesn't see it as a big problem. It never interfered with our active sex life. So I would start with that. I would say, you know, why, why do you think it's not a big problem? Uh, not that you necessarily would agree with him. Maybe you would. But why does he see it that way? And how much integrity is there in his position? And what I mean by that is, even if you don't like his view, 
is it a view that you think is honest and and that he's not deceiving himself or you around or does it feel more convoluted or complicated okay but understanding why he thinks it's not been a problem um would be important so so why does he think that what does the porn mean to him like what does he look at why does he choose it when you've had an active sex life how does he make sense of that and again this is about seeking to know him okay which takes courage i mean sometimes it takes courage for me to know why my husband wants things i don't want you know <laughs> because i just want him to want what i want i don't even mean sexually i just mean in in, in life that to really understand what he wants, why he wants it is stressful because then it challenges me to address in some way or be in response in some way to this person that I'm committed to and invested in. And so when it's an invalidating reality, like porn can be, that then it's much harder to stay curious and not go into judgment or just denial, not wanting to know. Um, so, so understanding why he thinks it's not a problem, why he thinks that, what does it mean to him, and how does this square with your view and honest feelings about it? And, and kind of how do you make sense of the discrepancy if there is one? Uh, is it about one of you not being clean about it? Is it about one of you wanting control over the other? Is it about you both wanting control? But if there's a discrepancy, what's your most honest view of why? Uh, okay. Uh, she goes on, he still feels, he still views it frequently alone. The only difference is he isn't deleting his browser history now uh, because I told him I didn't want him to hide these things from me. I've done a lot of work to help him feel comfortable coming to me. I mean, I'd be a little careful with that because this idea of helping him feel comfortable coming to you, come on, is he got his spine or not? I mean, he, is he going to have integrity or not? You feeling comfortable that you're not going to judge him is not the goal here him having integrity in his position is you having integrity in your position is but coddling him that and reassuring him that you're going to be accepting might be a way to try and extract more information from him but it's not a way to run a marriage because he needs to be able to stand by and back up his choices and if he can't and he's not comfortable enough with his choices, he needs to confront his choices and deal with them. Uh, but making it about you being happy with him is trying to run the marriage from the back seat. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Okay, um, let's see. The only difference is he isn't deleting his browser history. Uh, oh yeah, I've done a lot to help him feel comfortable coming to me, but I'm still struggling so much with him viewing alone so often. It's almost daily here. So my question is, Again, not not a challenge, but a real question. So, what is your fear? Like, because you're 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 struggling with him viewing so much alone, so often. What are you afraid that it's doing to him? What are you afraid it's doing to you? What do you think it may express about him or the two of you? Meaning, it's just important for you to try and get it to the next level. Like, what is it? Do I see a kind of indulgence in my spouse that you know that they they don't really that they can say like it's not a big deal but there's something kind of indulgent and irresponsible and sort of spineless about it um a little bit like somebody who would even be just like playing video games all day as opposed to kind of owning their life and claiming it and and really living within it okay um so what are the pieces that are operating that you find this difficult to be okay with and again, it's about coming to a clearer picture so you're not just reacting at the first level, but kind of seeing what's there and what it is you're having difficulty with. And of course, a good therapist or coach would be helpful around this to help you tease out the meanings that are operating. Um, let's see. This feels like such a strange place to be in and then trying to help him open up, but at the same time being in so much emotional turmoil. So that's exactly it. You're trying to manage how he feels while you're trying to manage how you feel, and you're carrying a lot, okay? And it's not your job to manage how he feels. It's your job to know who he is and to make good choices for yourself based on what you see about who he is and how he's choosing to live in his life. 
And it's not about managing his feelings. It's about you coming to an honest position within yourself, a thorough position, one that's really been thoughtful, not just reactive, and, and holding that position in the marriage, right? So I think that you're uh, not, again, I wouldn't be worrying about how he's feeling. I would be getting to what is going on with me. What am I having a difficult time with? Why do I imagine I should be controlling this for him? Because I think you're afraid if you don't, he wouldn't choose you or wouldn't be responsible. And I think he uses, there's a good chance if he's like most marital arrangements when this is going on, that one person is trying to manage his or her own feelings plus manage the other person's, is the other person can take advantage of that. That they can basically say, I'm fine with what I'm doing. I'm sorry you feel so bad but it's good down here in the basement looking at porn. <laughs> and, and they're not really confronting who they are and what their impact is because they know that you're anxious about it and you're kind of taking up the slack in a sense. And it allows them to not really get a hold of who they are and what they uh, want. I'm going to see. It's been helpful for me to hear you say, I want this couple to have more integrity and intimacy in their sexual relationship than they currently have. Yes. Would you say pornography use and the spouse's intense reaction to the use are both a reflection of the low integrity and low intimacy in the relationship? Yes, definitely. And the porn challenge is exposing that. Yes, exactly. Exactly right. So I don't know if you were on in the beginning, I was talking a little bit about this idea that if I were to say what porn often captures in marriages is this dependency on validation and it, it kind of, it, it exposes the validation system that's operating in the marriage, um, both in how the person who goes to it, why they go to it, how they go to it, and how the other person feels about it. And so as painful as it is, it is an opportunity for the marriage to get a deeper sense of individual responsibility and a deeper, level of integrity in both people because then you're running your marriage from a position of strength and deeper integrity not dependency on the other person um, and you know this is all developmental we start out doing these things most of us get married hoping to lock in somebody who's going to make us feel good about ourselves who's going to validate our sexuality who's going to um, revolve around us, even though it didn't work out for our parents that way, but we're hoping it will for us. And you know, a lot of us do that. And then marriage does what it's designed to do, to quote David Schnarch, and it exposes the limitations that you're currently operating within. And it's easy to say it's the marriage um, or your defective spouse. And, you know, your spouse probably does have some limitations that hurt, but a lot of times we stop there and resent as opposed to looking at how we're each operating in this system and how we can come to it with deeper honesty. So uh, my time is up, but so I hope that this can help you at least begin to start thinking about the ways in which, um, each person is often linking into the other person. Like the, you know, off, as I talked about in the beginning, the person looking at porn is often justifying it against their resentments or disappointments or the fragility of their spouse, which is a dependent position and is dependent on seeing their spouse in a particular way to justify a low integrity position, as opposed to claiming a position that they can live in honestly, unapologetically, and not be in a need for reinforcement from their spouse because they feel clear about the position that they operate within. And similarly to the spouse who has been disclosed to is to really look at what is my honest response to this? And am I being fair? And if I don't think I'm being fair, what do I feel in my gut is I'm not being fair about? Or if I'm very anxious and distressed, why? Is this something clear in me that I got married to somebody who's manipulative and using, okay? Because often that, I mean, I'll say one more thing before I stop. Often porn use outside of marriage or like when somebody is lying and deceiving is often exposing who the person is, okay? Now, that's the question I think it's often important to ask, which is what does this say about us and what does it say about my spouse? 
sometimes people just have so much anxiety about their sexuality, they have a hard time asking for what they want, and porn becomes kind of an easy way to sort of indulge a desire, but they just need to kind of grow up and deal more honestly in the marriage or deal with the invalidation of their spouse and, and speak more honestly and directly. Other times there's people who they're manipulative, they see their spouse as somebody who's supposed to reinforce them sexually, they want to be on top in every sense in the marriage and when they don't get that then they porn is justified because they're so resentful they don't get this kind of reinforcement through their spouse sexual reinforcement emotional reinforcement and so they it, it's it's just an expression of how they're living in their lives and and some people they don't get it through porn then they go and look for other versions of sex outside of marriage that the, the big headline is not the porn, the big headline is the, the, the narcissism or the self-reinforcement that they demand and they resent when they can't get it in the marriage. So a lot of times I think we get caught on the issue of sexuality rather than how is this person in relationship to their sexuality and to the people they're closest to. That's a more helpful question. And how does the issue of porn fit into that question? So, okay, everybody, I hope this has been somewhat helpful, even though this is a vast and uh, important topic. But um, I do talk about these things more, for those of you who want a little more on this, in the Enhancing Sexual Intimacy course. And, of course, a little bit in the Women's Art of Desire course, and I will be talking about a lot more in the men's course that will happen this fall. So, okay, everybody, thanks, and I'll see you next month. Bye.